Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Pocus Cases. In this episode, we are going to talk about free fluid in patients with abdominal trauma. This is one of the game changers for ultrasound. This is why you see ultrasound machines in trauma rooms, and this is why you see ultrasound machines in more and more emergency departments, because identifying free fluid in a trauma patient changes your management. Let's look at a case. This is a 60-year-old female who was walking down the stairs, tripped, and fell. She's complaining of abdominal pain. She's brought to the emergency department where she has the following vitals. She has a heart rate of 135 beats per minute, and she's hypotensive at 70 over 30. The rest of her vitals look pretty good. She is setting 99% on room air. She has an end tidal of 35, and she has a respirate of 20. Her temperature is also normal at 36 degrees Celsius. So what are we going to do? Well, if you follow ATLS, you'll start with your primary survey, the A, B, C, D, E of trauma. You'll assess the airway and the breathing. You'll look at the circulation, the disability, and then you'll expose the patient to look for evidence of trauma. You'd then move on to your secondary survey, and along the way, you'd probably get some imaging done on this patient, such as x-rays or CT scans. So where does POCUS fit in? Some people add an F at the end of A, B, C, D, E, so that there's an F at the end for FAST, which is a trauma scan you can do. I like to incorporate POCUS in the C of the A, B, C, D, E. I feel that the airway takes priority, and if there's a trauma patient who needs a secured airway, that that should be done before any ultrasound needs to be done. But when you're looking at the circulation of the patient and figuring out what their blood pressure is and what their heart rate is, it's a good idea to find out if they're bleeding anywhere so that you can start resuscitating them and managing them as you're diagnosing their problems. Let's look at the FAST. The FAST stands for Focused Assessment with Sonography for Trauma. And this is a nice review that was updated not too long ago. And it indicates that traumatic injuries is a leading cause of death in patients less than 45 years old. Also, intraperitoneal bleeds occur in 12% of blunt trauma, so we really want to find out where they're bleeding pretty quickly. And historically, DPLs, diagnostic peritoneal lavages, were done where you would use a needle and insert it into the abdomen and see if you can aspirate blood. POCUS is a more common way of doing things, and CT scans in centers that have CT scans can be used to determine if there's intraperitoneal bleeding. The beauty about the FAST is it's pretty fast, and you can find out pretty quickly right at the bedside if the patient has any intraperitoneal bleeding. Sensitivities range between 85 to 96 percent, and specificities exceed 98 percent. And in hypotensive trauma patients, the sensitivity of the FAST exam approaches about 100 percent. Experienced providers can perform the FAST exam in less than five minutes, and some really good providers can do a really good job in less than two minutes even. Finally, its use decreases time to surgical intervention, patient length of stay, and the rates of CTs and DPLs. So overall, doing an ultrasound in a trauma patient is a good idea. It's pretty accurate, and it's pretty fast. So let's see where we look for blood in the belly. Well, to start, you probably want to look in the right upper quadrant because in a supine trauma patient, and remember when someone has trauma, they're usually lying on a backboard on a stretcher, so they're lying pretty supine, fluid tends to accumulate in the right upper quadrant. So we'd start there by putting the probe with the marker towards the patient's head and looking to see if there's blood there. We can then move to the left upper quadrant and do a mirror view on the left side if there's any blood in the left upper quadrant. And we can also look in the pelvis to see if there's any fluid. This is what a normal right upper quadrant scan looks like. So this here is the liver, and right here is the kidney. And the kidney is one of the easiest organs to see in the belly because it has a double density to it. The inside of the kidney appears white on ultrasound, and the outside of the kidney appears black. And it's one of the very few organs that have this double density, so it's very easy to identify in the belly. And right here is the caudal tip of the liver. You can see this triangular shape that it makes. And here's the interface here. So we're going to look to see if there's any fluid between the liver and the kidney. 
And as I play this, you'll see that the operator is sweeping until the kidney disappears on one side, and then the kidney disappears on the other side. So they've basically swept through, and the kidney disappears on each side, and you're looking in the interface between the kidney and the liver to see if there's any blood there. And in this case, there's no blood in between the kidney and the liver. Let's look at this scan. In this scan, we have our kidney here and our liver here. And you can clearly see that there's black that is in between the interface between the kidney and the liver. And there's also some around the caudal tip of the liver as well. This is what a positive right upper quadrant looks like. Now let's look at the left upper quadrant. It's a little bit more challenging and tricky because the spleen's not as big as the liver. The liver tends to be glued to the diaphragm where the spleen's smaller and it's more mobile, so it doesn't say glued to the diaphragm like the liver. So the most likely place that fluid's gonna accumulate in the left upper quadrant is between the diaphragm, which is this bright white line here, and the spleen. You'll see as I play the video that the kidney will also come into view here. So here's our kidney, here's our spleen, here's our diaphragm, and you'll notice that there's black in the subdiaphragmatic area and between the kidney and the spleen as well. So this is another positive scan of fluid in the abdomen. So what determines an adequate right upper quadrant scan? In other words, how can I say that I've seen enough that I can call something negative? Well, for the right upper quadrant, you need to see the caudal tip of the liver, and you need to see the entire interface between the kidney and the liver. And this interface is known as Morrison's pouch. So if there's no fluid in Morrison's pouch, and you can see all the way to the caudal tip, and you've swept through the interface such that the kidney has disappeared on both sides, and you don't see any fluid, you can say that that's a negative scan. If you see fluid at any time in the interface around the caudal tip, then that is a positive scan. The left upper quadrant is mentioned is a little bit trickier. So here's a view of the left upper quadrant. And in this case, we need to see the diaphragm, because as I mentioned, fluid is more likely to accumulate between the diaphragm and the spleen. You also need to see the interface and the caudal tip. So to make it an adequate scan, we need to see the caudal tip of the spleen, which isn't quite on the screen here in this picture. We need to see that entire interface between the kidney and the spleen. And we're gonna need to see the diaphragm all the way up to about nine o'clock of the kidney. So if you drew a clock in the kidney, you would need to see to nine o'clock of the kidney. And if you can see the diaphragm to that point, and there's no fluid between the diaphragm and the spleen, there's no fluid in the interface, and there's no fluid at the caudal tip, and you've swept and the kidneys disappeared on both sides, you can call that a negative scan. If there's fluid anywhere in the interface, in the subdiaphragmatic area, or around the caudal tip, then that is a positive scan. And it's so important to look at that caudal tip because fluid can just accumulate around the tip of the liver or the tip of the spleen. So make sure you see the tip every single time. And you can see in this video, there's black just around the caudal tip of the liver in this view. That is a positive fast for fluid in the abdomen. Now, the pelvis is another area where we can look for fluid. The tiniest amount of fluid may appear here first, but we need to be careful when we ultrasound the pelvis. When we do ultrasound the pelvis, you're gonna see that there's a black area that we all have. That is the bladder, and you're allowed to have one black area on the screen. And we assume that that black area is the bladder, and here it is right here. It should be very anterior, and then this is a female's pelvis, so you can see here that there's a uterus. But notice there's another area of black below the uterus. And this is free fluid, as you can see, it's irregular shaped and it shrinks and grows as we sweep. And that is free fluid in the pelvis. The only problem is, is that females may have physiologic free fluid in their pelvis. So when you're ultrasounding the pelvis, you need to find out if the fluid in the pelvis is physiologic and it's supposed to be there, or if it's pathologic and it's not supposed to be there. One of the ways that you can tell if it's physiological fluid versus pathological fluid is if you only see fluid in a female's pelvis and you don't see it in the right upper quadrant or the left upper quadrant, then that makes it more likely to be physiologic fluid.
However, if you're seeing fluid in the pelvis and also see fluid in the right upper quadrant and left upper quadrant, then that more likely makes it pathologic free fluid. So let's go back to our case. Now that we know how to ultrasound for free fluid in the abdomen, our patient's tachycardic at 135 and hypotensive at 70 over 30 and is complaining of abdominal pain after falling down a flight of stairs. When we go ahead and do the right upper quadrant scan, this is the video that we get. So you're watching this. What do you think? Is there free fluid here in the abdomen or is this normal? Well, if you said there's free fluid there, you'd be correct. And I purposely chose a more subtle sliver of free fluid so that you can all see how easy it is to see the contrast between the black free fluid compared to the gray solid organs. Here's our kidney here. Here's our liver here. And we can see a strip of black that's irregularly shaped. And when we sweep it, it gets bigger and then smaller. And it's in Morrison's pouch, exactly where we'd expect it to be if there was free fluid in the abdomen. And this free fluid represents blood in the abdomen. So what did we do? Well, the trauma surgeon was called and we informed her that we had fluid in the abdomen in a patient who was hypotensive, who had sustained trauma. We resuscitated the patient with blood products. The patient went directly to the operating room. They didn't go to the CT scanner or need any other further testing. And a liver laceration was identified as the cause of the bleed. And the patient's hemodynamics improved after they finished the operation. The patient did well and was discharged on post-op day number three and continued to do well at follow-up. So you can really see how ultrasound can be very helpful in the trauma room to quickly determine free fluid and then rapidly activate the operating room and get the trauma surgeon involved and get the patient quickly to an area where the patient can be helped. But first, before we get too excited, you need to be cautious and there are some pitfalls that we need to be aware of. First one is POCUS is definitely not perfect. It's only about 85% sensitive in the vast majority of users' hands. The more experienced you are and the slower you sweep the upper quadrants, the better chance you have to see free fluid. If you are well-trained in point-of-care ultrasound, you get very, very good at detecting if there's fluid present or if you're detecting that there's no fluid present. It also requires the presence of more than 150 cc's to 200 cc's of intraperitoneal fluid to be able to detect it. You can improve this by doing serial fasts. If you do your first scan of the abdomen and you think that it's negative and the patient continues to have abdominal pain, you can keep them lying down on the stretcher and repeat the scan in five minutes time or 10 minutes time and see if you're now gonna detect fluid as more blood accumulates in the abdomen. If there's only a small amount of blood, you may initially miss it, but as the fluid accumulates in the abdomen, it'll become more and more apparent when you do your fast. So serial fasts are really important to do, especially if you're suspecting free fluid in the abdomen. Also, don't be shy to tip your patient in Trendelenburg position to help prevent false negative studies. This will allow fluid to get into Morrison's pouch so that you're able to more readily identify it. Finally, be aware that clotted blood can occur. And if there's any delay in presentation, such as the patient had a trauma and a few hours have gone by before they present to the hospital, or you receive the patient and transfer from another hospital and it took time to get to your site, that blood can clot. And when the blood clots, it looks more isogenic compared to the other organs. It won't look that nice black color that we see. It'll look more gray and it can blend in with the other organs on the screen and doesn't look as nicely black compared to the other organs and may be missed and act as a false negative. So just be careful of that. Another caution you need to be aware of is that retroperitoneal bleeding or source of bleeding is not gonna be necessarily found on ultrasound. So POCUS can't really interrogate the retroperitoneal space well, and it's not really gonna detect any of your retroperitoneal bleeding. So if the patient's bleeding retroperitoneal, your ultrasound of the intraperitoneal cavity, which is what you're learning about here, would be negative. Also, POCUS is used for determining if there is intra-abdominal bleeding, not where the bleeding is coming from. So the ultrasound won't tell you that there's a splenic laceration 
or a liver laceration or a bowel injury, all it will tell you is that the patient sustained bleeding in their abdomen. And then finally, there are false positives, and there's quite a few of them. So false positives for intra-abdominal free fluid include ascites. So the patient may have a medical disease and sustained a trauma, and they have ascites that's known to them. And when you ultrasound them, it looks like they have bleeding in their belly, but this is just their known ascites. Maybe they're a peritoneal dialysis patient, and there's some remaining leftover fluid in their abdomen, and that would lead to a false positive as well. Females who rupture ovarian cysts, specifically hemorrhagic cysts, uh, it looks like they're bleeding their belly, and if they sustained a trauma, the fluid in their belly could be a cyst that has ruptured as opposed to bleeding from an organ. Ruptured ectopic pregnancies can also cause bleeding in the abdomen, and that's not really a trauma cause to it, but you'd want to know if they have a ruptured ectopic pregnancy, and you can use this ultrasound in your patients who are pregnant with abdominal pain to look to see if they have a ruptured ectopic pregnancy and speak to your gynecologist urgently to let them know that you're suspecting a ruptured ectopic pregnancy if you see free fluid in the presence of a positive beta HCG in abdominal pain in a pregnant lady. POCUS really cannot distinguish between blood versus urine. So in your patients with severe pelvic trauma, if they were to rupture their bladder and there is urine in their abdomen, it would look the same as blood. So just be careful that if you're suspecting a bladder rupture, that that might be urine you're seeing in the abdomen and not bleeding from an organ. And finally, perinephric fat can be mistaken for fluid. In patients who are obese, they will accumulate fat around their kidneys, and this fat won't really look black, but it won't really look like the kidney. It'll be a gray that can be mistaken for fluid because it'll be a different echogenicity than the other organs around it. So just be careful that if you see perinephric fat, just remember if you're seeing the same amount on each side because we have two kidneys, so if you're seeing that same amount of grayish echogenicity on ultrasound, that it may be perinephric fat. And finally, just remember that women and children may have physiologic fluid in their pelvis. So if you're seeing fluid in the pelvis but not in the upper quadrants, that could very well be physiologic fluid in women. Men should not have fluid in their pelvis unless it's contained in their bladder. And unless you're seeing fluid in the upper quadrants, the fluid you're seeing in the pelvis is likely physiological fluid in females. So really we're going to be focusing on the right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant in trauma. And if we're seeing fluid there, then that is concerning. That's almost always pathologic if you're seeing fluid in the right upper quadrant or the left upper quadrant. Some experienced trauma doctors would not even look in the pelvis for free fluid because they know that they can be fooled that that could just be physiologic fluid and they stick solely to the right upper quadrant and left upper quadrant. So in summary, if you have a patient who sustained a trauma and they're hypotensive and you see free fluid in their abdomen, you should be activating an operating room and getting the trauma surgeon involved in the patient's care. There is no value in bringing them over to the CT scanner in this case because CT scanners are where patients go to die in this scenario. There's nothing therapeutic in this case that a CT scan can provide. And as mentioned, the trauma surgeon is going to do their protocol of doing a trauma laparotomy in this case and looking for the source of bleeding. You also want to ensure that you're not just looking at the interface between the solid organ and the kidney. So in the right upper quadrant, not only do you have to see that interface that we call Morrison's pouch, but you need to see the caudal tip of the liver too. And in the left upper quadrant, not only do you look in the interface, but you've got to see the caudal tip of the spleen, and more importantly, the area between the diaphragm and the spleen, which is where fluid's most likely to accumulate in the left upper quadrant. And finally, there are many limitations, including false positives and false negatives for a right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, pocus for free fluid. So be aware of these limitations and know them well. And as always, if there's any questions, I'd love to hear from you. You can email me at pocuscases at gmail.com.